What's with the name? Didn't you know that there are over 200 titles and names attributed to Jesus Christ, both in the Old and in the New Testament? They reflect the nature, the divinity, the humanity of Jesus Christ. It also reflects His position in the triune God, and it also reflects His work here, in, here on earth. The question being, when we study the names and titles is, how do we respond when we hear the names and, and, and titles of Jesus Christ? The next slide will tell us that the first title we, we took was from Ephesians chapter 2, which is Jesus Christ, the chief cornerstone. Again, all of these are illustration, metaphors, uh, so we can, we can relate to the meaning. So, Jesus is the cornerstone of a building, which is his church uh, spiritually. He cements together both Jews and Gentiles in the building. Both male and female, all the saints from all ages, from all walks of life. That's why he is the chief cornerstone. And then it was followed by the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. The next slide. If he is the King of Kings and Lord of Lords, according to 1 Timothy and Revelations 19, it means that he exercised absolute dominion. It means that there is no power higher than Jesus Christ. Why? Because he is all powerful. And then followed by the next slide, which is the faithful and true. The same in Revelation 19. That this Jesus is not a fake Jesus. Jesus this Jesus is not a cheating Jesus. He is a faithful and true. And last Sunday, I, I shared with you that one thing we have to appreciate with husband and wife is the word faithfulness. You want to be a faithful husband, you want to be a faithful wife. And in a family, you want to have a faithful mom and dad and a faithful children. We have here the faithful and true. He never changed. You know why he never changed? According to the song we sang? Because there's nothing to change. He is perfect. You only need the change when there's something to change. Now, is there something to change with Jesus? Nothing. Now, that reflects his divine nature. The chief cornerstone, the king of kings, the lord of lords, the faithful and true. Now, reflecting his position in the Trinity and reflecting his work, I open it up with the next slide. If there are seven churches in Revelation, seven trumpets, seven vials, seven seals, seven last words on the cross, we have the seven I am, all in the Gospel of John. Isn't that wonderful? The perfect number, seven. The completeness in Hebrew numeral numerology. The seven I am, the bread of life, the light of the world we took last Sunday. Today we're going to take I am the gate or I am the door. I am the good shepherd. We took already I am the resurrection and the life. When he says, the next slide will tell us I am the resurrection and the life. Next slide, please. He embodied within himself that he is the only source of eternal life. You cannot buy it. You cannot earn it. You cannot work for it. The only way you and I can have eternal life with God is through the resurrecting power of Jesus Christ. And then last Sunday, next slide, will tell us that he is the bread of life. Just as the bread sustains life in the physical sense, which is synonymous for the word food, Jesus is the bread that gives and sustains eternal life. God provided manna in the Old Testament while they are wandering for 40 years in the wilderness. And he also provided 
eternal life through Jesus Christ. What you and I have now is physical life. I think it's far more important to dwell as well on spiritual life. The life after physical life. The next slide will tell us that He is the light of the world. Why do we need light in darkness? The answer is to dispel darkness. So when He says, I am the light of the world, and he who follows me shall not walk in darkness, but have the light of life, according to John 8, 12, right? It reflects his divine nature. This, is, this light is not powered by battery. This light is not powered by a solar energy. He created sun. He created the greater sun and the lesser light, the moon. He is the light. Notice that he is not a light. He is the light. Jesus came into the world darkened by sin, jealousy, hatred, and anger. And his light, the light of life, is the light of truth. The only way we can dispel fallacy, errors, and, and fake news is find the truth. The truth is found in Jesus Christ. Today, we are going to dwell on the third I am of the seventh statement. I am the door. Next slide, please. I am the door. Then Jesus said to them, most assuredly, I say to you, I am the door. In other translation, I am the gate of the sheep. I am the door. If anyone enters by me, will be saved and go in and out and find pasture. What does it mean when Jesus says, I am the door of the sheep? This is a declaration, this is a proclamation that points to his unique identity, unique divinity, unique purpose. I am the door. What's the purpose of the door? To protect people from the outside going in. That's why you close the door from the inside. You open it from the outside. Basically, protection from unwanted intruder or people to go in. I am the door. And then he says, he who enters by me, he who enters through me will be saved. Saved from what? So this is an exclusive nature of salvation from the physical standpoint of a sheep and a shepherd, so that Jesus is saying, I am the good shepherd. I am the great shepherd who leads the sheep into the sheep fold, and I am the only door, no other doors, no exit, just the entrance through him. And the only means we can receive protection, eternal salvation. When Jesus Christ was talking to his followers, and there are also religious leaders listening, right? These religious leaders do not follow to hear the truth. They follow to check on Jesus. When he committed mistakes, then they're going to pin him down. In order to understand this passage, I am the door of the sheep, we have to understand why he uses this metaphor as one of the title. Context, context, context. During the time of Jesus, there were no businessmen like we have in the Wall Street or New York. Most of the people 
are shepherds and farmers. Some are hireling, employed by the rich people to work on their farm, hireling. So you got the shepherd, the sheep, and the hireling, okay? What do we know about the sheep? We have to understand what a sheep, the nature of the sheep, what is a shepherd, the nature of the shepherd. So Jesus is giving us the picture that if I am the shepherd, I am the great and good shepherd, you are the sheep. Meh. Understand what a sheep is. Next slide, please. What do we know about the sheep, right? Number one, let me walk you through. This is not an extensive one. Did you know that a sheep is a domesticated animal that are the most helpless animal? Sheep will spend, number two, their entire day grazing, wandering from place to place, never looking up. And as a result, number three, sheep often become lost. They don't have a sense of direction. That is the physical sheep. Number five, they don't have this homing instinct that when they go out of the house, they know how to come back. They don't have that homing instinct. Number five, they are incapable of defending themselves when the bear or the lions, the predators arrive. They are just there for the taking. They are helpless. Number six, by nature, sheep are followers. They follow the shepherd. And if the shepherd leads them to a cliff, the sheep will just jump off the cliff. That's how stupid and helpless the sheep are. Because they don't have a sense of direction. They just follow the leader. And the sheep are easily susceptible to injuries. Number eight, sheep are utterly helpless against these predators, which I alluded a while ago. When the wolf and the bear enters the pen, they cannot and they won't defend themselves. They won't even try to run. Instead, you know what? When the predators enter the sheep pen, they huddle together. They huddle together. And if the sheep fall into a moving water, they are not going back. They're going to die drowning. That's a sheep. Unlike the dog. You throw the dog, they're going to do like that and go back. Not the sheep. If they fell, they're going to die. And by the way, didn't you know that sheep fear moving water and will not even drink in a moving water? Anything that's moving, they are afraid. Unless the water is perfectly still, then they drink. That is why David says in Psalm 23, you can say it with me, the Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. He maketh me to lie down in green pastures. He leadeth me beside still waters. So now you understand what the sheep is, right? Imagine that you and I are helpless on our own. We cannot fight the predators eternally. We don't have a homing device to go back to our home or houses. Now, if that is what a sheep is, let's understand what a shepherd is. Next slide. What do we know about the shepherd? 
Sheep are totally dependent upon the shepherd who tends and care for them. Number two, shepherds were providers. Shepherds guides. Shepherds protects. Shepherds constantly have this compassion and merciful attitude toward the sheep. So close was the bond between the shepherd and the sheep even unto this day in the Middle East. That shepherds can divide the flocks that have mingled at a well during the night simply by calling their sheep. This is one thing I like. Shepherds were inseparable from the sheep. Why? Because the shepherd would lead the sheep to a safe place to graze and to make them lie down for several hours in a shady place. And when the night fell, the shepherd would lead the sheep in the sheepfold. So if you are a shepherd during that time, your sheep recognize you by your voice. So if I am a she shepherd, Brother Abraham is a shepherd, and Jack is a shepherd, we have different way of whistling or calling our sheep. And didn't you know that even shepherds name their sheep? So when they call them, where is Ryan? Ryan! And then Ryan the sheep will just run towards the shepherd. February! February runs the... If other shepherd will call Ryan, that Ryan will not go because he knows his shepherd, the voice. It's the voice of the shepherd. The sheep, the shepherd, the sheep pen. Next line. There are two types of sheep pens, right? One is a public like this, the sheep fold, where you gathered your sheep for the night. You cannot leave them in an open area because the wolf will kill them all and eat them all. That's why you need those rocks built in villages. So we, we, we discovered that these sheep folds or sheep pens, there is a public, if you are in the city of you know, New Brighton, if we are grazing sheep over here, there will be a doorkeeper for this particular sheep fold. Because not only Abraham's sheep goes there, Jack's sheep goes there, Ephraim's sheep goes there, they mingle together. So if Jack calls his sheep, all Jack's sheep will be going out. Abraham comes along and Abraham calls his sheep. Ephraim's sheep will not follow Jack and Abraham, no. They know the voice of their shepherd, even in a public Sheep pen. Isn't that nice? It's just like when we were growing up. Look! Oh, that's my dad. When he says, Luis! Oh, 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 he is angry. I know my dad's voice. When he is angry and when he's loving, the voice will tell you. Even the calling of the sheep. The second is not, it's not like this public the second the next slide it's called countryside in circle the sheep pen was nothing more than a rough circle of rocks piled into the wall with no small opening to and with a small opening like that one and the shepherd would drive the sheep at nightfall since there are no other gates, the shepherd will stay on the gate. The shepherd sleeps at the gate. That's the relationship of the shepherd and the sheep.
And that's why Jesus says, I am the door and I am the great shepherd. He who enters by me will be saved in and out and will find pasture. That's the context of a shepherd and a sheep and a sheepfold. Next slide. So in this context, telling you about the sheep, the shepherd, and the sheepfold, Jesus is telling us, you and me, that he is not the only the shepherd of the sheep, that he is also the door. Not the preposition A, but the article D, absolute singleness. No other door, no other great shepherd than Jesus Christ. In doing so, he vividly contrasting himself with religious leaders of his time whom he described as thieves and robbers in John chapter 8, 10, verse 8. When Jesus says, I am the door, I am the gate, he is reiterating the fact that only through him salvation, eternal life is possible. Jesus makes it clear that any religious leaders who offer salvation other than his teaching, they are thief and robber. That's why one who believes the gospel and one repents of sin is assured of being in the fold. How can you be in the fold? How can you enter through that door? Is through the giver and the source of salvation. Not just for the night, for all eternity. Knowing that the world is full of predators, full of anger, jealousy, hatred, and in our 21st century, it's so hard to discern which is true or not, especially in this social media charged culture. More importantly, we are fully confident that when the chief shepherd appears, we will receive the crown of glory, according to 1 Peter 4. The question is, if he is the door, have you entered that door? Are you enjoying the sheepfold? Have you heard Jesus calls your name? Let's move on to the next title of Jesus. I am the good shepherd. Next slide. John chapter 10, verse 11 and 14. The good shepherd gives his life for the sheep. I am the good shepherd and I know my sheep and I am known by my sheep. This is the fourth of the seven declarations in the Gospel of John. What does it mean? We've understood a while ago the good shepherd, not simply a good shepherd, because he is the good shepherd. He has a unique character of being a shepherd. He is not fabricated. He is not wearing a mask. He is genuine and true. In character, Meaning, when he says, I am the good shepherd, he is wholesome, he is beautiful, he is noble, innate goodness, inherent goodness, inherent righteousness, inherent compassion, protector, provision. This good shepherd protects, guides, and nurtures his flocks. As he did in being the door of the sheep, Jesus is making a contrast of himself between the religious leaders, the Pharisees, the Sadducees, and called them a hireling. If Abraham owns a number of sheep, Ray and Born can apply as a hireling, right? Abraham owned 100, for example. 
sheep. And he will, he will hire a hireling named Ray for 50 sheep. And then hire born for another 50. And they were going to graze them in the green land. And they will be paid. That's a hireling. But when the predators came, born will run and Ray will run because they are just hireling. But if the owner, the real owner of the ship is the one there, just like David, he's going to use everything within his power to protect all his ship. So Jesus is saying, I am the good shepherd. I am not a hireling. I will not run when predators attack my ship. I will protect them. So that in John chapter 10 verse 9, Jesus speaks of the thieves and robbers who sought to enter the sheepfold. These thieves and robbers are pretending to be shepherds in a public arena, in a private pen, sheepfolds. In this passage, the Jewish leaders, the Pharisees, are contrasted with Christ who is the door. He is a faithful shepherd, not a hireling. This was the characteristic of a true shepherd. And however, some of the hirelings thought only of themselves. They will not give their lives for the 50 sheep. No. The payment Abraham is paying me, says Ray, is not enough for my life. I don't care about the 50. The wolf, uh-uh. I'm going home. That's a hireling mentality. But if you are the owner of the sheep, you're going to fight for that one. You're going to protect them. Just like David, right? As a result, even the wolf appeared the most common threat to the sheep. In that day, the hireling will abandon, will run amok, and will fled, leaving the sheep scattered and be killed. That's what he's saying in John chapter 10, verse 12 to 13. So that to understand better this good shepherd, during the times of Jesus, we have to realize that the sheep are utterly defenseless and totally dependent on the shepherd. That's one. That's why when he says, I am the good shepherd, I will not run away. I will protect. I'll put a hedge of protection. Sheep are always subject to danger and must always be under the watchful eye of the shepherd as they graze. So rushing walls of water down the valleys from sudden heavy rainfall from the top may sweep them away. Robbers may steal those sheep. Wolves may attack. This great shepherd will stand guard. That's why he's called the great shepherd. We have a record of David telling how he killed the lion and the bear defending his father's flocks. And, and your imagination will run that with a slingshot that he mastered. The same slingshot that he used to kill the giant Goliath. He practiced it in lion, the wolf, and the bear. That's just like it. Driving in snow in winter, blinding dust and burning sands in the summer, long and lonely hours, this shepherd patiently endures the weather. The cold of the night on winter, the heat of the sun in summer. For what? Patiently enduring for the welfare of the flock. That's why he's called the good shepherd. And they frequently subjected to grave danger, even their lives. So likewise, having this in context, Jesus gave his life on the cross, the ultimate, the ultimate good shepherd. 
And he promised that he who enters by the door will be saved and find pasture, will be nourished. This great shepherd had the power to protect, to guide. Just like in Matthew 20, 28, the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and give his life as a ransom for many. That good shepherd went to the cross for the sinful human sheep. Gave his life so that the Satan, the predator, will not feast on this sheep. The sheep has the opportunity to choose who to follow. Through Jesus' willing sacrifice, the Lord made the salvation possible for all who come to him in faith. So that, that when Jesus says, I am the door and, and my sheep know me and I know them as the Father knows me, even so I and the Father, I lay down my life for the sheep. The only way, the only way salvation will be made possible for sinful humanity is through Jesus Christ. Everyday people die. Everyday people are being, now in Ukraine, they are massacred because of this senseless war. How many, how many, what do you call this one? Uh, they, they bury these people, mass grave, that's, that's, that's the term, mass grave. How many mass graves? Not, not just adults, but even children. How inhumane this war. Why? Because of power, maybe greed, reputation. Not our great shepherd. Jesus' death was divinely appointed and it is only through him that we receive the salvation. Beautiful John chapter 10 verse 14. Jesus makes it clear that it wasn't just for the Jews that he laid down his life because most of his followers are Jews but they are also available for Gentiles like you and me not born with Jewish parents but also for other sheep I have which I are not of this fold that refers to the non-Jews so brothers and sisters If we consider ourselves as a sheep, can we say that I am totally dependent with the great shepherd? That's a wonderful relationship we can find in the sheep and the shepherd. Unless we find ourselves totally dependent from the Lord, we cannot enjoy the sheep pen that God provided. And He provided a lot of sheep fold. If I may use that analogy, there are churches that you, be, you can be with and grow, being nurtured by that great shepherd through the word. I hope and pray that if you haven't entered the door or the gate and if you haven't heard the voice of the great shepherd, today is a wonderful time to say, Lord, thank you for calling my name. I would like to enter that door. I would like to find pasture and nourishment in that sheepfold.